Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this course pop up. My name is Nick Reese, and I am delighted to be teaching emerging technology and national security for the Center of Global Affairs at NYU in this coming spring semester. And today's class is going to be about quantum computing. Quantum is a, is a, as a subject is something that sometimes it can be a little bit intimidating and people think of and they hear it and it sounds, uh, you know, like science fiction, and it was even in the title of a recent James Bond movie. I can assure you that it is definitely not fictional, but that we will talk about some uh, espionage, state secrets, state security, and state power. So I want to start the, this, uh, this course by talking a little bit about uh, quantum and what it is and why this matters, and then we can get into the geopolitical context of, of all of this. So quantum information science is an interdisciplinary field that uses the really peculiar properties of subatomic particles to manipulate information in ways that are kind of difficult to, uh, to, to imagine today. So if you think of current computers or, or in, the, in the jargon, we would say classical computers, everybody has heard of bits, right? We've, you know, bits, bytes, megabytes, terabytes, yottabytes, and those bits, as most people know, would be represented by a one or a zero. And it's just kind of a, a yes or a no, a true or a false, a one, a zero. And long strings of this binary code can create different things on your, on your computer from the video that you're watching right now, the colors that you're seeing um, and the computations that your computer is doing in the background. But the thing about the, these kinds of bits is that they are binary. So it's one or the other. And so when a, when a computer is doing the calculation, it has to it has to go through each one of those to, 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 to evaluate yes or no, up or down, one or zero. So the interesting thing about using a quantum computer is that instead of using bits, we can use what are called qubits or quantum bits. And qubits can be a one and a zero and everything in between all at the same time. So if you imagine, you know, a, a, like a, a two-dimensional circle going from one side to the other side would be analogous to one or zero in a classical bit sense. But every point along the way would be another way for us to represent information. But we could do it across multiple axes. We could do it across multiple phases and dimensions. And that's what makes quantum computing really powerful. And this is something that we'll go into in more depth um, in, the, in, the, in the longer version of the course. But for now, we have to think about how much differently we can represent information with a quantum computer and with quantum bits than we can with uh, regular bits. And what this does is this is going to increase computing capacity. And this computing capacity is going to uh, bestow upon us some pretty extraordinary power. And that's really what we're here to talk about today. And specifically, we're going to talk about how this type of quantum, this com quantum computing is going to be able to break the asymmetric cryptography that we are using right here, right now, today. And it's something that we didn't think we would uh, ever be able to break, but now we're just a few years away. And this is something that uh, the U.S. government is putting a lot of, is giving a lot of attention to, specifically because it has statecraft implications. And that's what this whole course is about. Different technologies having statecraft implications on, uh, on the geopolitical stage and what that causes different powers to do, to say, uh, and to put their resources behind. So to talk quickly about asymmetric cryptography, uh, right now that's like your RSA uh, encryption, which, which we're using right now. And that is based on prime number factorization. So you get a big number and that's your public key. And then the question is what two prime numbers can you multiply together to get that big number? And that's really hard. That's really hard for a classical computer to do. In fact, it's so hard that even the biggest supercomputers in the world will still take literally billions of years of continuous computing time to be able to break that encryption scheme. And this is actually a perfect illustration of just how powerful quantum computing is because a quantum computer of sufficient capacity, which we don't have yet, but is coming, Instead of taking billions of years, we'll take just a few minutes with a thing called Shor's algorithm. And so this is a 
a monumental change in, in how we, we use and manipulate information. And it's something that's coming rather soon. So right now we're talking about technology as an instrument of statecraft and quantum as that specific example. But I wanna go back and talk about some history first. So the contention that any technology, in this case quantum, is going to impact state uh, is going to impact statecraft is not exactly news. In fact, we've seen examples of this throughout history, and we've seen the the Athenians built uh, the walls around Athens that caused Sparta to believe that the entire balance of power had shifted, and it kicked off the Peloponnesian War in 431 BCE. Other examples come to mind. So we can think of things like Greek fire, the Ottoman cannons around Constantinople in 1453. Dreadnoughts uh, around the end of World War I, aircraft carriers, inter intercontinental ballistic missiles, and of course the big one, which is uh, which is nuclear weapons. But if we if we take a step back for a second, we can think about why these are an interesting but not exactly analogous um, example of what we're talking about with quantum. So what's interesting about each one of these examples is that the state or the states in possession of these technologies would go to extraordinary lengths to make sure that all of their foes know exactly how effective their weapons were. They wanted to showcase just how powerful they were as a deterrence factor. And so they would also go to great lengths to ensure uh, that the, the technology was kept secret and about how it was weaponized, but the deterrence was really central to how states would put create policies, how they would uh, budget their resources, how they would um, budget their their money and put their put manpower toward. And that's really how you can evaluate the types of things that um, that states are particularly interested in and are and are and see as opportunities or threats to to their uh, sovereignty or to their existence. And so, you, when you created these types of weapons like aircraft carriers, we're not exactly hiding that we have aircraft carriers or how many. We want people to know. We want uh, to, that power to be demonstrated. And we do it all the time with things like naval exercises and, um, and other demonstrations. So if quantum computing is going to be a major factor in, in geopolitics, how exactly would it be implemented? How exactly would we use quantum computing and would it be analogous to what we're talking about here so if you think about what quantum computing is going to do so we're going to be able to intercept communications or data uh, in transit collect that data and then run the algorithm to decrypt the encryption around that uh, around the encryption algorithm around that data or that message or that piece of communications. And right now, states can states can do this now. States can can intercept a communication in transit, but they can't break the encryption. So what we're saying now is that quantum computer, a, a quantum computer, you're going to be able to intercept the the transmission, give it to a quantum computer, and a couple minutes later, it will have decrypted the asymmetric encryption algorithm. Uh, based on prime number factorization. So now we're talking about the ability to manipulate information, to intercept communications, to um, to st like steal intellectual property, to steal data. All of these things are are, are wide open now once that that quantum computer is uh, is is available. To be clear, quantum computers are available now, but they're not at this at a sufficient capacity or at a sufficient maturity level to be called, what is called in the industry uh, cryptographically relevant. That means a quantum computer that is capable of breaking the encryption algorithm. We know that it will be able to because it's mathematically proven, but the actual machine is not ready yet, which is why this is such an important topic to talk about right now. So quantum computing is also going to do things like uh, increase speed and capacity for other for other applications. It'll be weaponized, but there's other applications here like simulation, sensing, uh, quantum networking, and, and others that are really that are really exciting. But if you have a machine, if you're if you're a state, if you're the head of a, an intelligence service in a in a 
in a nation state and you have in your possession a quantum computer that can break the communications of your adversaries nearly instantly. Is this something that you would advertise? Would you hold a uh, a parade in your in your country square and 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 put your quantum computer on the back of a truck and and showcase how how powerful you are? You probably wouldn't uh, tout that kind of accomplishment because this and, and this is what makes quantum computing somewhat scary in the in the statecraft sense the biggest use the most utility that you're going to get out of your quantum computer is the ability to steal communications but that your adversaries don't know you can decrypt right now there are plenty of of uh, of attempts to steal encrypted data and in fact there are even countries that are have been well documented stealing things they know they cannot decrypt keeping it until they have a cryptographically relevant quantum computer that's going on right now but if you if you have if if the first state that develops one is going to have a weapon of extraordinary power and but you wouldn't you wouldn't advertise it you wouldn't this isn't a deterrence type weapon so the better analog here to talk about with weapons is actually the breaking of german enigma machine at bletchley park one of the most highly guarded secrets of the entire war was the fact that the Allies were able to decrypt the German Enigma messages. In fact, there's famous stories about the British allowing certain uh, ships to be sunk so that the Germans didn't suspect that we had the code. This is going to, this is the game. This is going to be what happens in uh, geopolitical competition now. And forward is this idea that we will have this race for this new piece of technology that has such implications that the first country that has it is likely to keep it quiet. And that's that's scary. It it is it is a, a difficult thing to think about uh, to be able to have this this capability um, and to know that their data is being stolen now so that it can be decrypted later. So. Where does this leave us exactly? So we've got this science that's being matured. The engineering is developing around it. There are quantum computers out there right now. Several companies like Google and Honeywell and IBM are working very hard on developing the capacity for quantum computers. In fact, in, in a couple of weeks, it's rumored that IBM is going to uh, announce their Osprey machine, which will have 433 qubits. Uh, that is a, That represents quite a leap forward in number of qubits, but remember that number of qubits alone is imperfect measurement of cryptographic relevance. So don't, don't worry just yet because the estimates uh, vary widely, wildly on where, how, how, what it will take to achieve cryptographic relevance and when that will occur. So right now the, the government is putting a lot of effort into transition planning and we'll, we'll talk some more about that. But where does this leave us? Are we are we just kind of feeling around in a dark cave, un, un, unsure of our surroundings, unsure if something's going to jump up and bite us? Well, you know we're we're you know we're unsure what's being stolen and why and all these other things. Well, let me let me go ahead and put your mind at ease for a second. Your data is definitely being stolen, so don't don't concern yourself about that. But when can it be broken? That's that is definitely a question, and the 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 estimates are are, are quite varied in exactly when uh, that will occur. So if you think about what this will mean in the future, control of information, intellectual property, data, source code, these are the things that we are competing over geopolitically right now. And you can see how some countries are going to extraordinary lengths to kind of cut the corner when it comes to research and development, particularly of these types of technologies like quantum. And quantum is such a good example because it is pre-standardization. Because it hasn't been standardized yet, it's more valuable geopolitically. And if you, if you look at what's motivating all of this kind of behavior, it's this idea that what we are competing over in the great power competition, I'm sure you've heard this buzz phrase, what we are competing over is dominance in the operationalization and uh, and, and monetization of 
emerging technologies. And there's a lot more to that story, but the innovation ecosystem that we're creating is not just about creating new products. It's not just about uh, economic opportunities for technology, but it's also about our homeland security, our national security, our economic security. And these are, these are central to how to think about the geopolitical landscape today. We have to consider that unlike in years past when maybe we were competing over things like um, like economic systems uh, or, or religion or territory, we're now competing over research and development. And it's not just the governments that are involved in this, it's private companies. And the battlefield on which this is unfolding is through the cyber means, is through cyber. And so cyber attacks that are targeting research and development and intellectual property are an existential threat. It is something that we have to, we have to grapple with and we have to look at because imagine for a second that a state in uh, outside of the US or, or outside of uh, your home country is able to get a hold of some critical intellectual property related to quantum. And that speeds up their quantum research by five years. If that happens, we have to really think about what the implications might be to how we use the internet, how we communicate, how we share data, how we store data, how we keep our financial transactions secure. Any, any and all of those things will be at risk from a, a cryptographically relevant quantum computer. So when we, when we think about great power competition, when we think about the use of technology and statecraft, these are things that are not exactly new ideas, but there's a new spin on them. And the spin is, what is it that we're competing over in great power competition? We're competing over emerging technology and the valuable commodities are available through cyber means in intellectual property data source code. What technologies are going to be transformative? Quantum computing is going to be is going to fundamentally change everything about how we deal with information, secure our communications, secure our data. And that is much, much different than a, a new type of missile or a, you know, or, or from examples from history, you know, the large walls around Athens or Greek fire or the Ottoman cannons. These, this is, is going to be considerably different because there's no deterrence factor attached to it. It's going to be secret. It's going to be quiet and it's going to unfold in very different ways. So quantum computing in statecraft, this is, this is going to be an issue that we all face, and it will be probably the most important cybersecurity issue that we face. And that's why you see right now the, the community is small but growing of professionals who look at emerging technologies as a, as a separate geopolitical issue that impacts cyber and other issues and has the potential to really transform our security. That's a community that's growing. And that, and that small community is what developed things like National Security Memorandum 10 in the United States that starts to call for the transition from current cryptographic algorithms to new cryptographic algorithms. And so you, you can see that this is beginning, but it's just at the start. And I, I encourage all of you to really look into this issue, uh, particularly no matter what your your kind of focus is, government or engineering or business or whatever whatever your focus is, this is going to impact how you do your work and how you how you prosecute your mission. So, I uh, I I'd like to uh, I'd like to yield the floor. I, I appreciate everyone's time, um, and I'd like to take a look uh, in the Q and A to see if there are any questions uh, that I can answer. Thanks everyone for the time. This has been fun. I have uh, just a couple more minutes, so I, I can expand on a couple of uh, a couple of things. Um, 
But, uh, oh, I've got a question. So the question is, um, or I guess more of a statement, uh, there is no going back on old data unless you re-encrypt it. Um, so for the, for the data storage issue, um, one of the one of the big things that we're working on right now is the idea of uh, cryptographic agility in the future. And cryptographic agility is going to be a really important factor because it's going to allow us to transition not just from this particular uh, cryptographic algorithm to the next, but after that, but after to the next one and the next one and the next one. And so uh, we we are definitely addressing and thinking a lot about. Um, how to work with old data and older systems. So that is something that is the technology is, is the technology, the engineering is still uh, being worked out. So I have another question. Um, how will quantum computing play a role in disinformation campaigns? Yeah, that's that's an excellent answer. Thank you, Danny. So for disinformation campaigns, one of the most important things you have to have is uh, an, an understanding of, of what the kind of current state is and then how you want to change it. So you need a lot of intelligence uh, inject into your misinformation campaigns. You have to know what's going to work and, and know how you're driving the conversation. And so... Um, and so what you what you do is you, you you know that that intelligence gathering piece especially through in intercepted communications will be considerably better making the misinformation campaign considerably better because the the uh the collection is is feeding into it so uh so the the quantum so quantum computing will play a role because it will be able to um, not only see what's available on say social media but also your most uh, private communications and um, that means that the in disinformation campaigns will get considerably worse. And then uh, back to Warren Warren's question he talked about he said uh, there's there's no way to protect data that's already stolen yeah that's exactly right so that's when we were talking about uh, the steal now decrypt later that's exactly what we're talking about and that's underway right now and so if you think about what that means for you know research and development uh that is still 10 years away but a quantum computer comes you know in eight years there's still data there's still um there's still proprietary information that even 10 years from now we would not want to be public and so this is already a problem that is that is growing so another uh, another question um as technology becomes more and more relevant in uh, global policy spaces uh, and as states develop or update cybersecurity policies, how can we ensure these normative frameworks are rooted in human rights, gender sensitive and inclusive? I, I'm so glad I'm so glad you brought that up. So um, one of the, the primary uh, issues or primary things that we're talking about uh, within the government space is ensuring a a, a safe and smooth transition, but also an equitable transition. And you, you can hear this in um, a couple of the uh, government uh, official speeches and things like that that we've seen over the last year or so. But that equitable piece is really important. And uh, one of the ways that that, that is being done is uh, we see a lot of people from the government going out and um, you know, educating and talking about what this means um, and making sure that uh, we are kind of democratizing what is, in fact, a very difficult subject, but we need to kind of bring that collective understanding up. And we want to do that for everyone. We want to do that across the board so that uh, the private, the, the data and the communications across all those uh, those areas that you list are is, in fact, uh, kept secure. Uh, next question from Athena. Um, how do you apply quantum technology in higher education? Uh, such as subject matters uh, to educate the college students who are interested in studying cybersecurity. What are the essential courses for that students should take? So that that that's a great question, a really important one because the as I was mentioning uh, in response to the previous question, the kind of baseline knowledge of what quantum is is actually I, I would say probably a big gap that we're seeing across across all different sectors, all different populations. Just you know, we don't necessarily need to know the equations, but you do need to know the why, when we say this is different, why is it different? And why does it matter this much? And I gave just a quick, you know, expl explanation at the top, but there's more to it than that. And so as far as the the additional courses, I mean, really the, the courses are kind of siloed at the moment. So there are cybersecurity courses, there are quantum courses, there are geopolitics courses that, that are all sort of separate. But um, 
as, as we can see in the in the government policy world, these things are starting to converge, and you're starting to see it converge um, in academia as well. And this course is an example of that. Uh, so another question, um, uh, and related to that, how can we protect uh, activists online? So this is something that's it's extraordinarily important, and um, the way that we protect activists is is going to be the same way that we protect. Um, the intellectual property that we're developing, which is the same way that we protect economic opportunities and, and all of these different um, aspects that are taking place across cyberspace. So it's we have to transition our algorithms from factorization-based asymmetric cryptography to what's called lattice learning with errors cryptography, uh, which is also asymmetric. And so the uh, National Institutes of Standards and Technology within the Department of Commerce has uh, created uh, some algorithms that it is currently standardizing. Those are going to be due out in 2024. And at the Department of Homeland Security, there's a great uh, roadmap out there at dhs.gov slash quantum. I encourage you to check it out, where uh, it talks about things that organizations can do to start to prepare themselves. And so that transition right there is going to be extraordinarily important. Um, and the resources that are out there are, uh, are, are growing. There's more coming because there are, are good people uh, working on this issue uh, as their primary jobs. So you'll see more and more um, information out there uh, to transition your algorithms. And that's going to be the first step to keeping activists online safe, uh, which is also the, the first step in protecting our intellectual property and all these other really important things, um, not only to maintain our our democratic values and the and the things that that we hold that we hold dear, like the the, the causes that that activists work for, but also uh, our national security, our economic security, and our homeland security. Um, so I, I hope uh, I hope I've answered uh, these questions. I have just a couple more minutes here uh, before they're going to uh, yank me off stage. So um, if there are any other questions I can ask, I would be or I can answer, I would be more than happy to. Um, also happy to uh, to to elaborate on anything as well. Um, but until we get another question, I don't want to waste any of your time. So I just want to kind of wrap up the course today by saying that. You know, quantum computing might be the most, uh, the, the the biggest example of uh, of a of a globally geopolitically impactful technology, but it's not limited to that. There are others out there that will be covered in in the uh, in this course, uh, emerging technology and national security, and so we'll talk through several of these different uh, these these different. Um, Technologies. We'll talk about the concept of convergence, which is you know you 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 combine something like a quantum computer with artificial intelligence, and you create this kind of power law raise in rise in in mission capability or in 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 technical capability. And what does that mean for for national security? And we'll talk about how emerging technologies really are the the new quantity, and it's. You know, unlike the Cold War, where we were competing over, you know, communism versus capitalism, you know, economic and political systems, you know, and in, in, in the era of non-state actors, we we were competing, you know, against things like, um, you know, like uh, like radical, you know, terrorism organizations and and uh, and others, and so, but that era is different now, where you hear great power competition, so we have to answer the question: What are we competing over? And it's things like quantum, but not limited to that. And we'll cover more of that um, in, in the course. So Warren has a question. Um, nothing preventing other countries from leveraging this. And if they can sniff intercon intercontinental traffic, there is there are no protections. So even good intentions uh, we have will be useless. Well, so I, I do want to, just in the last minute here, say that there are a lot of great opportunities that come with quantum computing that are outside of the cryptography space. Cryptography is the thing that we can take action on now. And it's also, it serves as a really good example. But there are a lot of really great uses for uh, for quantum computers, especially as they grow in capacity. So there's there's a lot of really good reason to be excited about this. But what we what we have to concentrate on is the idea that uh, is, is transitioning our algorithms to keep our data and communication safe. And that that has to be number one, but we have to realize what this means in, in the geopolitical conversation. Think about what Bletchley Park meant in World War II. 
you take it up a few orders of magnitude, and that's what we're going to be dealing with soon. So I am now out of time. So I want to thank everybody for attending. I look forward to seeing you in the spring. This has been a lot of fun. Have a great uh, rest of your day. Thanks a lot.